Greetings and welcome to the Quest for Wisdom podcast, where we search for nuggets of wisdom from the lives of some truly amazing people. Today's guest is Neil Harbison. Neil is the first legally recognized cyborg in the world and has an antennae attached to his skull which perceives light frequencies from infrared to ultraviolet and converts them to sound vibrations in his head. Neil creates music and art, exploring identity, human perception, the connection between sight and sound, and the use of artistic expression via new sensory inputs, and he has also given a TED talk about his project. Neil is pushing the limits of the brain and providing himself with an extra sense to work with. He can connect to the International Space Station and hear the light frequencies that are in space, as well as have frequencies sent directly into his brain. He is also developing a project to use a heat source orbiting his skull once per day to alter his perception of time. Neil is a curious and pioneering individual who is redefining the limits of human capability. To find out more information about Neil, check the links in the description. I hope you enjoy our conversation as much as I did. So, welcome, welcome, Neil Harbison, to the 20th episode of the Quest for Wisdom podcast. How does that make you feel? 20? Episode 20, yes. Good, good. I like this year is, is my actually 20th cyborg birthday as well. So 20 is a, a good number. Really? How old are you? Uh, depends how you calculate my age, but the antenna is 20 this year. On in March, on March 22nd, it will be my 20th cyborg birthday. Really? And how many biological years have you had? <laughs> um, double the, the do- double of this. Yes. Oh, so you're you're blessed with uh, you're blessed with the Spanish genetics of looking young then. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, uh, yeah, I'm so happy to have you here. I've been looking forward to this for months, hence why I've been pestering you all the time. Um, this is, yeah, it, it's very, very exciting because uh, you are a an artist. You are a pianist. You're an activist. You're a musician. But you are also a cyborg as opposed to the 19 other humans that I've had already on this podcast. Yeah, I'm a <laughs> cyborg, yes. <clears throat> so how how did that come about? And can you explain why you first originally decided to become a cyborg? Um, <clears throat> well, I it's not that I decided to become a cyborg. I, I suddenly felt that I was one. So but this antenna project started as a music project. So I, I was studying music. And I was studying well, experimental music. And then we did some lessons on cybernetics and how technology could create sensations, not only give us information, but it could create senses. And then I was interested in merging with technology to, to feel colors and to transform colors into sound. It, it was all of an art project. And then I ended up implanting this antenna in my head and then I started feeling that the antenna was part of my body and my senses and then I started to feel that the word cyborg really defined what I was feeling, which is that I felt that technology was part of my mind, not only my body, but I, I felt that I was technology. Yeah, because I, I like I mentioned to you before, I listened to a lot of your stuff and the one thing that I found especially interesting was that the moment that you mentioned in in one of your videos i think maybe the ted talk where there was there became a point where you couldn't distinguish between your antennae and your own brain um and so like how 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 can how did that feel to you when you suddenly didn't didn't quite recognize the difference between what was coming through the antennae um and what what was your your own thoughts from your brain? Well, it was a at the beginning when I had the antenna implanted, it was chaotic, and I was hearing vibrations and sensing vibrations, and I, I it didn't make any sense. But slowly, the brain started transforming this stimuli into information and into. Uh, 
a feeling. So it, it was a, a process of, of the brain adapting to the new stimuli. And then when it became normal, I started to feel no difference between the software and my brain. And then it's when it started to feel that uh, technology was no longer a tool, but an organ, and that my brain was also cybernetic in a, in a, in a way. So I felt that the word cyborg really defined this. Cyborg means cybernetic organism. Yeah. And I feel that I'm an organism with cybernetics. Yeah, because you were you were the first, if if I'm not wrong, you were the first legally recognized cyborg. Is that correct? Well, this happened in yeah, 2004. I had to renew my passport, mm. and the I have a UK passport. So then I I had to well I sent the image the photo. And they replied saying that I was not allowed to appear in a passport with electronic equipment. And then I replied saying that it was not an electronic equipment, that what they were saying is was an, a new organ, that I felt that I was a cyborg, that I felt that this was part of me. And then they replied saying no again. So it became a battle in 2004 with letters, many, because it was by post. By right, time. right. <laughs> and it in the end, they accepted the antenna as being part of my body as an organ. And then, in a way, they accepted that I was a cyborg because I defined myself in the letters as a cyborg. So then when it was accepted and I appeared in the passport with the antenna, journalists said it was probably the first time that a government had accepted a citizen as a cyborg. That's, that's amazing. And how long did that whole process take? three or four months because it was yeah a few months okay and so what exactly does the antennae pick up it picks up um light frequencies from infrareds which are invisible to ultraviolets which are also invisible so between these two there's all the visual spectrum and all of these colors are sent to the back of my head into frequencies so the frequency of color uh, creates different vibrations in my head and this allows me to hear and to feel colors so then i i can tell if there's infrared or ultraviolet or yellow or blue in front of me without having to use my eyes wow because you are you you were born totally colorblind weren't you mm -hmm. and how how rare is that because I don't think Why I've ever come talking? across anybody that's that's totally colorblind. You probably have, but you, maybe they didn't tell you because yeah. it's an invisible. No one. I mean, yeah, I've met uh, maybe ten or twelve in in my life okay. because they they know that uh, I am. So, but it's one in every thirty three thousand people that wow. are completely colorblind. So it's not that rare then. There is still loads of people that have this affliction. Yeah, usually some, most of them have other um, issues as well. So Such as what? Like photophobia. Like uh, okay. Maybe they wear sunglasses. Uh, but it depends which type of achromatism you have. There's four different types. Uh, in my case, I don't have photophobia. Okay. Um, so it's one in every 33,000 people, but it includes all types. Right, okay. And did that make life difficult for you growing up? It made it a bit confusing, not <laughs> difficult, but it was confusing because everyone was talking about something I couldn't see or understand. But it was just a mystery. It still is because color is a bit strange. So, um, it's not the problem if you don't see it, but it makes you think a lot about why does it exist? Why do some species sense it and some other species don't sense color? Why does it influence humans so much? Um, yeah, that's a very interesting point about the influence on it, like reds being used to signify love and danger and all these different things and 
blue to be calming if you're in a therapy center it's it's very strange what are your thoughts on why that is well one reason is cultural because if you change countries then you will see that the there's different meanings and different ways color is used in different continents mm. so it really one thing is culture and the other is what we relate color with like blood is red so then red is usually associated to something dangerous uh but True. there's a lot of other colors that it's a bit more strange very um strange basically uh, and you can easily distract people with color or you can avoid people from stealing your bicycle if you paint it pink or <laughs> you can there's different things that affect humans that that, it, that it's not only cultural there's something else yeah it's very interesting and i can see now that you've you've changed like the angle of of the antennae because at first when i first started investigating you and you're explaining the different um, things you can pick up, you know, you pick up different colors and they translate to vibrations. And you mentioned it being a bit like uh, going around a supermarket and playing an orchestra, you know, because you can point at different colors and you hear in vibration the sound. And you actually, I think it was in the TED talk, you gave uh, an example of kind of like playing a sort of a song with different colors, like, which I thought was really cool. But then I wondered, does that not drive you crazy? can you turn it off by just pointing it at you? Like what happens if you just point it at your, at your head? Does it just like buzz continuously? Yeah. If I find my head, then the color, if my, I'll listen to the color of my skin or, but color is never stable. There's always subtle changes in color. Our, our skin is not always the same color during the day, depending on the light. Now there's a bit of yellow light, so um, colors keep changing. So there's never a permanent, like paper is not always white. It depends on where it is, the color, the light. So, um, so, so do you, no, always, no. So, but do you always hear some sort of sound then? Always, yes. Always. And did that take some time no. to get used to? Unless I block it completely, if there's no light. Oh, so it needs it, some light. Color is light. So if there's no light, there's no color. Okay. So and did that take time to get used to then, to hear that constant? Because some people go crazy, you know, when they have tinnitus ringing in their ears. Um, did it take you time to adjust to hearing that vibration? Yeah, it took me like four months. At the beginning, I had strong headaches. It was uh, confusing, chaotic, and tiring, very tiring. Mm. But I designed it in, the, in a way that I thought it would, it would slowly become normal. That at some point, the brain would have to get used to it. So I didn't stop it from... I didn't switch it off. Uh, I think that's the... the the trick is that you should never switch off a new sense. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, your brain will never get used to it. So you need to insist that this is the new no normality and then the brain will have to accept it. So it required a lot of discipline then just to keep yourself like mentally training basically every day. Hmm. Well, I'm waiting. I'm waiting. waiting for the brain to accept it. Yeah, because like... It must be a little bit like having racing thoughts at first, you know, and they are very tiring, like you mentioned, when, when your brain can't switch off. But would you say now that, do you think more in pictures or words, generally? Um, I think a mixture of both. I don't know which one more. Okay. Because, like, in, in my case, for example, I think probably 95% in words... Um, I could think in pictures if I really tried, but I just, I don't do that naturally. Um, but then do you, when you think, do, does that thinking now involve the vibrations mm. 
mm. as well as pictures and sound. Yeah. Uh, pictures and words, sorry. So you're thinking yeah. now in, in like three senses, basically. So like, so, so your mind's eye, basically, your mind's eye now includes words, um, images, and vibration, mm. and sound. Mm. And sound, yeah. Wow. So you're really, it's really pushing the boundaries then of what the brain can do. Um, because it's, it's adding something totally extra in, which is, is, it's really hard to, it's really hard to wrap my head around what that would be like to add something else on top of that and have a whole extra dimension that you're thinking in. Yeah. I don't know. I, I never thought of, of, uh, I, I know that in my dreams for sure, I I dream in my dreams there is the I sense the vibrations of color and when I think as well yes if I think about something that happened yesterday this memory includes as well the vibrations of the colors from yesterday are mm. there are there any colors that do not have a nice vibration you know like it's not a pleasant sound for example well, ultraviolets are very high pitch, yeah. so they can be very annoying or disturbing. Violet is the highest in the visual spectrum, and then you go up to ultraviolets, and this can be um, very annoying. It's so it's, where where would you encounter that? Like the the UV, I suppose, in a nightclub or something. Well, when it, sometimes there is high levels of UV just in the street. Oh. when you go out or when I connect the antenna to other sensors like NASA's International Space Station they have there's a way of connecting to the to the International Space Station and that's when I sense lots of ultraviolet yeah because I, I heard you talk about that before I was going to ask that that what like for people who don't have the antennae what is the purpose of those people connecting to the space station? And like, and how did you learn to do that? Did you have to build a sort of an API into the space system? How does that connection actually work? Well, NASA has lots of public. Um, it, it's public. You can use lots of the data that they are receiving live from space. And anyone can use it for any reason. So, um eight years ago or so, I went to, uh, it's called uh, the search for SETI. I don't know, SETI is beside NASA. It's like search for extraterrestrial intelligence, and they also do lots of projects with the uh, sensors that are in space. And I spoke to them, and they said that I could easily use any of the existing data mm. from just connecting online. My antenna has internet connection, so if I connect my antenna to the live feed from the station, then the colors I sense are not the ones in front of me, but the ones that are being sensed by the station. So that's a way of having a sense in space and being able to explore space by connecting our bodies to, in, in this case, to the International Space Station. Also, we're doing a project in Spain where a satellite will be sent, and then they'll, that, that will give us the option of connecting to this specific satellite that will be sent in, in Andalusia, in the south of Spain, next year. Okay. So, so when, you, when you connect into the space station, you're basically connecting to their data stream, and your mm -hmm. antenna is then interpreting that data stream. Um, and are you hearing, like... like can, can you explain how that actually works? Are you just hearing like all these different sounds going up and down or can you actually like sort of probe around like that? No, there's uh so I just sense the colors from space. So for example, what like in the in a satellite there's lots of different sensors mm -hmm. and then you can either pick the gravity or uh mm, cosmic rays or you can decide to just sense colors so i decide just to sense colors so then when i connect i only feel the colors from space and how are those colors <laughs> like very disturbing there's lots of high pitch uh, frequency 
colors of ultraviolets that are very close to each other. So it creates a lot of... So when there's like, like, if you're looking at something, or in that case, you're connecting to the data, do you hear one color at a time, or do you hear like a cacophony of colors, like a, a, a symphony of color at the same time with everything that's coming through? The antenna only detects one okay. at a time. But okay. then the brain, my brain creates uh, chords. Oh. So um, how, how quickly is it detecting? So if I he- listen to yellow and blue or yellow, blue and pink, my brain creates a C major chord. On, <laughs> even though I'm listening to three colors separately. Whoa. So you, so you can make proper songs in your head? All the time, yes, because there's uh, notes everywhere. So just by moving the head, you can create different melodies and chords. and Very microtonal as well. It's, it's not what you would usually hear on a, on a piano. It's, it's much more microtonal. So okay. there's lots of notes in between notes. Right. Right, okay, so you're not necessarily hearing nice, perfect intervals. It's not what people would say nice, no. (laughs) But I like it. It's it's unusual, but it can be disturbing. It's definitely unusual. Um, And so the the satellite in uh, that's being launched from Andalusia, what will that be? What's the purpose of that satellite? The purpose is different things. They'll, they'll, they are launching it to detect different things related to Andalusia. Okay. But I'm collaborating with them so that I can use their uh, sensors to connect it to humans. So there will be not only me, but other people that will connect their bodies to the satellite so that they can explore space by having a sense connected to space during the period of time that it will be orbiting okay. so it, i think this is uh i call it becoming a sense drone out it's a having sense senses in space and then exploring space without having to physically go there yeah that's it's almost like a uh, virtual reality taken to another level because it's like a uh, real reality but still at a distance that's very far um, and obviously, like, this is the very beginning of it with, um, with like, basic senses like this. What, would, what, do, what do you see in 20, 30, 40, 50 years um, as this technology um, and also desire from people increases? Where can you see the, the finishing line? Or not even finishing, but the, the long distance? Um, well, I think there'll be two options one is merging with ai or merging with as some people will merge with technology to gain intelligence others will merge to gain new senses Mm. and some might do it for both but i think it will become much much more normal to have technology implanted for different reasons um probably to communicate it will be one of the first mass ones so that we can communicate without having to block our ears. So having ways of talking to each other online through bone implants instead of using air conduction. Yeah, because I've seen it recently. It's become, seems to be more popular, those um, cranial headphones, you know, that go outside. And I tried those on the bone conduction ones. And that seems to me quite cyborgy. Obviously, they're like, they're still headphones and they're not connected to your body but it won't be very long before they are like you say and people might have like a little implant here and here that they can Mm. then talk with anyone um what do you think are the dangers of this Mm, there's several like biocompatibility like not all bodies will accept the material that is implanted. So that's the first main risk when you add a new organ or a new device. Like you add something external, your body might reject it. So there needs to be a lot of options for different bodies. 
the other is brain rejection. Might maybe the brain will reject the new stimuli or the new something. It might not be an input. It might be something else. So, so brain rejection or body rejection, social rejection as well. These are the three main, I think, problems that one might face if. Uh, you decide to merge with technology. Yeah, I hadn't really thought of of um, the brain rejection because there could be, like you say, plenty of people whose brains they're not capable of taking on an, an extra sense, taking on the extra workload. Um, and I wonder what the problem with that would be if that started happening. But another thing I, I wondered about, and it worries me a little bit about Neuralink and um, any sort of brain modification with... Uh, with technology is how long will it be until ad if you have a Neuralink chip and, and some sort of internet connection how long will it be until adverts are basically forced into our brains and or you're hacked and and, and your brain your, your brain chip is literally hacked what do you think the risks of that are um yeah, it's a risk. But the, I mean, people will get used to it as well. So in the same way that there is always a risk when you eat in a restaurant that there can be some poison in the in the food. When you have an implant, there's other risks that you might be hacked or you might receive unwanted publicity. But there will be laws regulating this. So, I mean, if some if there's a law that regulates that no ads can be sent to someone's brain without permission, then they, they breach the law and they will have a, I guess they would have a problem. There are, there will be laws regulating all these cyborg laws. So I don't think we should worry too much. Um, I think the best thing is that you should be part of the creation of the implant that it will go in your body. I would always suggest that, that you, Try to avoid buying implants from a company and try to create it yourself so that you know exactly what you're doing. Yeah, I, I think the, the only problem with that is that not not everybody has the money or brain power to, to create something like this. You know, like it's obviously something that's very close to your heart, but really most people would be buying them from, from companies, I suppose. But did the... Was the procedure for you expensive overall? Mm, no, because uh, the, the material is not expensive. Mm. What is expensive, I guess, it's time. What I spent is time, a lot of time, a lot of time to create. But um, the doctor that did the surgery, he didn't want to get paid, for example. Oh. The things, the, the code and all this that we've created is... We, we've collaborated with people. It, it hasn't been, no, it hasn't been expensive. And would you, would you, or have you sold your idea to anybody, like allowed them to use your software and your technology? All the organs and sensors that we create are open source. So oh. anyone can recreate this. Um, actually, it's, it's very uh, simple to create a new organ and now it's even more simple because now with chat gpt you mm -hmm. can create the code in a few seconds before it took us months to create the code for this the code for other implants but now you just ask chat gpt to create a code with a specific chip that does this and then transforms it into that and it it creates it uh so since we have this tool we are uh, well, it's even easier. And then there's lots of YouTube videos that can help you create a new organ and new sense. So I don't think, well, depends on what you want to sense mm. and how you want to have it implanted. But most of the things that people want to sense or perceive, they could create it on their own if they, not that complicated. Okay, so I, I was thinking it was going to be some long, really complicated, expensive process, but it's actually quite accessible for people to do. 
if you know what you want, yeah, the, the problem is that it takes long to decide what you want to sense and how you want to sense it and in which form, in which organ. This is a creativity, creative process that can last long. First, decide what you want to sense because there's so many options that it's difficult sometimes to choose exactly mm-hmm. what you want to sense. And then you will probably find technology that can sense what you want to sense. And then you can find the smallest technology that can sense this. And I try to connect it to a, a Arduino, like a mini brain. Right. Create the code with ChatGPT that transforms this sense into something that you want to feel. How do you want to feel it through thermoception or electricity through sound, so vibrations. And then once you have the, the components, then you can find biocompatible material and try to adapt it to your body. So that like as a prototype, you can start with a, a, a fast or easy prototype and then you can start experiencing having a new sense. Wow. Um, so, so it's actually quite, it's very accessible, especially with ChatGPT now. And um, in how many people do you think there are in, in your community um, with different sensing abilities? There is Moon Rivas. She's been sensing earthquakes yeah. with implants in her feet. Uh, Manel de Aguas with two fins here, two implants to sense the, the weather. Um, Paul Lombarte has uh, electrodes and he's sending his heartbeats to the internet and then he's creating artworks with his heart. Oh, really? Um, so that's not a sense. It's a, well, for him, it's also a sense because he, it's a proprio sense. He's more conscious of his own mm. heart. It also has a light here and people can see his heartbeat live. So <laughs> every time. Um, there is uh, Kai Landre with two implants here to sense cosmic rays. Dodo in the Czech Republic to sense um, radioactivity. In Chile, there is uh, um, Esteban Celis. And he's, well, in Chile, there's a, he can sense, well, the north. He sends uh, geomagnetic. Oh. So he can also sense something else. Uh, well, um, and Joe Dagny, he also had two implants here and at the back for 360 degree perception. Mm, <laughs> well, and so do you, do you all know each other then? Like, have you, do you meet up for conferences or, or things? Is there, is there like an actual organization you're all part of? Well, we've, yeah, we created one a few years ago called the Transspecies Society. Mm. And that was for people with non-humans, non-human identities. And some of them were in this group. Also, we created the Cyborg Foundation Labs and we created some, but now we're a bit disconnected it, since the pandemic with, we've been a bit, uh, but yeah, we have a WhatsApp group and also we, yeah, sometimes we connect and sometimes we meet in events, yeah. Oh, cool. So you're all, so you're all like kind of friends and monitoring monitoring each other's progress and everything along that. Um, but that reminded me as well. Can you explain about, because I thought this was really cool as well, um, about the ball bearing that orbits your skull? Because um, the, the thing I saw... You were mentioning that basically, the the it orbits your skull in twenty four hours, um, and you're trying to learn to tell the time precisely based on where it is in your skull, and then you want to alter the speed of it and see if you can change your perception of time, which I thought was really cool, and I'm really excited to see how that turns out because time is one of those really really bizarre things um, that if it can be like hacked or modified in some way i just i really interested to see what the results of that would be yeah it's an organ for specifically designed for sensing the the passage of time the, the mm. 
for sensing time. Basically, it's a point of heat. It takes 24 hours to go around the head. And then if you feel it for several months, your brain will slowly get used to it. And then it become it should become subliminal that you don't feel it anymore and that you know exactly what time it is. And then whenever this happens, the aim is to modify the speed. So someone without you knowing will modify the speed and then you should be feeling that time is stretching or going a bit faster. And have you got to the stage of modifying the speed yet? How long have you had it for? I had it from 2000 and well, during the pandemic, I was, I had the sense, but then there were serious problems with the points of heat. I had several burns, so I had to have it removed. And I'm hoping to have it installed again in March for the 20th anniversary of the antenna. I'm hoping to, I will probably cut the antenna, make it shorter. Mm -hmm. And then this will give space for the, for the crown to sense down time. Oh, so you're going to get it basically outside. Because w- was it was it subdermal before, under the skin? The first, it's never been subdermal. Oh. It's always been outside. Because first it needs to work properly outside. Then if it works properly, then it can go inside between the skin and the bone. Oh. But for now, uh, we've had problems. So it hasn't been implanted. It's been installed out from outside okay and so you had it during for like one year or two years and did did you learn one then year. one year and in that time you learned then to tell the time accurately yes but then it started to burn oh my god <laughs> <laughs> so it was not good yeah it's not a part of your body that you want to get burned uh, oh but that's but yeah. And then I tried to, then I moved it here. I did another prototype lower and it didn't go well either because I was, it wasn't a good area. So I I moved it back up again. And now the final design is almost, I don't, I don't have it here, but it's almost, yeah, it should be ready in March, but I want to have my brain tested before. Right. Because something that uh, I didn't do with the antenna, my brain wasn't, uh, tested before I oh. uh, and I, I missed this so for the time the sense of time I want to have a proper brain test uh, before then during the the time and then after when we start creating time illusions okay to see if there's any like parts of the brain grow or shrink or change or anything like that well to have a a a doctor's point of view of what's happening not only my personal experience but also something from a third person observing in that it makes it more objective that's a shame that um it's a shame you missed it at the beginning but i suppose the future people that come they'll have to be so much so much to learn and so much to study from from this and i suppose we'll learn so much more about the brain based on the changes that do happen from these new senses Mm-hmm. Um, but I suppose that the crown is probably going to look really badass as well. <laughs> then you've got the crown and the antennae. You'll then you'll look like um, you'll probably look a little bit like um, Lord Elrond from Lord of the Rings when he wears that little that crown around there. That's kind of what I'm imagining it being like. Well, I think I will cut my hair again like this, and then the crown will be inside, so you won't see it. Oh, okay. I think at first you should keep it for a little bit like that because I think that'll be way cooler. Um, And can you explain as well about the... Because there are some people, aren't there, that have access to send things to the antennae. Um, So I think, was it five different people that can send you colours at any time during the the day? And was there also... Do you still have the Bluetooth tooth? Um... (laughs) The connection to my head was for for a, a while. It, it, there was five people that had permission, but now I stopped it. Um, and now there's only one person that can connect to my head, and it's via an NFT. So it's there's an NFT that allows you to connect to my head. So it's a safer way of using the internet connection to my head. 
because otherwise in the other form I could be easily hacked uh, so by using the blockchain you don't it's it's almost impossible for anyone to hack and you have to buy the NFT and then the NFT has an unlockable content that allows you to click and then there's a way of sending colors to my head so there's only one person that can send colors the the owner of the NFT and is that is that a friend of yours or do you let that basically be sold around it can be sold around yes i it's not it doesn't belong to me anymore so do you know who it does belong to yes um, but that um, unless i didn't check if if he has sold sold it but and did they yeah. did, did he use it much or have people used yeah. it much we we yeah 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 and how so when they send something to you do you know straight away that that's coming from something external not straight away uh but yeah because it doesn't make sense like colors change when i move my head so if i'm still and then suddenly colors I start sensing colors that are not that doesn't make sense that are in front of me then it, it's coming from the internet <laughs> so strange um and then uh, explain the bluetooth tooth as well because i thought that was pretty cool this was a project we did in brazil and it's a tooth with a small button when when you click you send a vibration to someone else's mouth and then when this person clicks, you receive the vibration in your mouth. So if you learn the Morse code, you can send words and you can communicate via Morse code by clicking your teeth. And it works through Bluetooth. So it's a Bluetooth tooth. It connects to your mobile phone and from the mobile phone to wherever the other mobile phone is. So, And how do you charge it? Well, it's a it's a tooth that like old people that can remove it. Oh, right. Yeah. So there's a there's a space here. All this space. Yeah. Is for the Bluetooth tooth. Ah, oh, so then you click down at the back, so you don't keep it in all the time. So you remove it, you charge it, and then you have a clip, and then you can communicate. Oh, so you don't usually keep that in. No, no, no. Because then it would probably be annoying for the person <laughs> if you're if you're no. eating and it's like zzz, zzz, zzz. no. This was a a project and an experiment to see if it worked and it worked. And then the next step would be to make it smaller and implantable. But yeah, it's it's challenging because you need to charge it. Although it doesn't, it, it, you maybe would have to charge it every few months. Right. But still it's challenging to have electricity in the mouth because it's uh, very wet yeah and so the the antennae do you do you charge does that unscrew and then you charge that at the end bit no this is the tip of the end this is all fiber optic okay so it can be cut or changed this is a tube that covers the fiber optic and it goes back at the back of my head where there's the chip and where I have to charge it from, with induction from the outside. Ah, so you have like a little kind of metal thing on the back of your head. There's the metal, and then there's the implants inside with the ah. chip and the glue. So do you have like? So do you have to kind of, if you're doing it by induction, do you have to kind of like lie down? How long does it take to charge? An hour, less than an hour. So you just like lie on a pillow basically and just let it charge. Mm. Oh, because I wondered at first, I didn't think it was possible, but I wondered if it could use the electricity in your body. But then I suppose that that's probably there's not enough of that to be powered. Yeah, there is lots of it, but uh, there isn't the technology is too big to charge with my own energy yet. But yeah, the aim would be to use blood circulation, like a turbine in the blood vessel that would continuously charge the chips the implants or body energy, but still this creating energy from the body is still not very safe, basically. And, and, but yeah, the aim is to use body energy, but still we're not there yet. 
Yeah, that's a really clever. It's a really clever idea to put the turbine in the blood vessel, but I suppose that's also very dangerous. Um, yeah, because it can create clots. Yeah. But that would allow us to charge continuously the implants, and you don't need much energy. It's continuously charging it. Even if you could like take a tiny bit of the power that's from the the pumping of the heart, if you could connect something in that and just like siphon off a small bit of the power from there, you could probably get loads of power out of that. Yeah, well, like Paul Lombarte, the one that's doing things with his heart, he can turn on, like, he's used his heartbeats to make clocks work, for example. So the energy of his heart made a clock uh, move. How does he connect so, it? Through cables or oh. through uh, now. Now he's using Wi-Fi, but the energy of the like, if you connect um, electrodes, and then you connect this to a clock without the clock yeah. doesn't have a battery, you connect it, and then the clock would move. Whoa, that mm. is really cool. So, what are your like what are your upcoming projects and how much more modification do you imagine yourself doing my main project is the time the sense of time i should i should uh, start with it this march march the 22nd did you say mm. one month after my birthday you're 22nd of february 22nd of february 222 yeah yeah mm -hmm. So I'm going to be turning 30 in three weeks today. <laughs> um, so, so the next project is the time, um, and that will probably take a lot of time to get used to that. It has taken a lot of time. Like, I've been working on this since 2016, so it's been this, it's the sense that has taken the longest to create. Oh, really? Hmm. That's interesting. What's so what's so complicated about years? What's so complicated about making the technology? Uh, the heat, creating heat that doesn't burn your head. Uh, that does the. I mean, the temperature of your head keeps changing as yeah. well. So that's challenging because you need to feel the point of heat, but the temperature changes, so the organ needs to know at what temperature. Um, it needs to be so that it doesn't uh, feel too hot or too cold. Basically. And then also, yeah, it's been it's been difficult uh, this one, but and I think now it's it's gonna work. And it must also be difficult, I suppose, to get the heat really, really precise. Because, like, I suppose you need like. 360 different like it, it needs to be very precise doesn't it to, to be able to accurately point it to a certain part of your no but if if you only have uh, like this one's on then you turn this this point on and then this one starts getting cold it feels it really feels as if it's moving it's uh, also like a it doesn't you don't need to have lots of points if you don't oh. just have one here and there it feels as if it's rotating right this, is, because... this works uh you have a point of heat that gets hot then this one starts getting a little bit hot and this one gets a bit cold and then it really feels as if, it, as if there's something moving from left to right so that works oh that's really interesting so you're like you're slowly heating one up and slowly cooling the other one down and it's that change in temperature that's actually creating the sensation of it moving yeah so that's what has been a bit complex to create um because there aren't things this doesn't exist so re, re, there, there isn't anything similar either uh, so it has been created from zero there's no sometimes we create senses that already exist like sensing where the north is there's ways of using technology that already exists and having implanted but this circular an organ that is circular 
mm. close is, is uh, it's been more difficult than than we first thought. And so, are you involved in the actual manufacturing of it, or are you designing it? And you know, like how how involved in the actual making of the product are you? In all the process, yes. Okay. But you don't but you don't physically make it or you do also physically engineer it or is that something you pay someone um, to do? No, I never we never pay. We always collaborate. Uh, ah. So if, if we collaborate with students or with um yeah, with students. Most of them are students. Uh now it's also an art student doing it um before yeah, it was more difficult before, but now it's easier. As I said, since we have AI, uh, to me the difficult thing was to creating the codes. And right. uh, now there's no, it's such a difference. So now the difficult thing is solding, but I know how to sold a bit. Mm. And then also I know someone that is really go, good in solding. What we need to pay is usually the surgeons or nurses the people that cut and stitch and usually yes but but in this case you don't have to do that because it's external yes although it might be stitched i mean it will be external but it will it needs uh, to be permanent right uh, i like uh, when we have external also there needs to be a way of being in to avoid the temptation of having it removed it's good to have it in a way that you can't easily remove it. True, true, true. Ah, oh, so I'm, I'm... also sometimes we pierce uh, external or like um, it's like a like an earring, but you mm. have it through and then ah, it, it... like a little hook. Yes, like a hook. Yes. And um, how were you feeling before? you before you went through this procedure like the, the originally but before the antennae because obviously it's the first time doing something like this so were there nerves yeah but happy because it, it to me it was really difficult to find a doctor yeah willing to drill my head this was the most difficult part of the whole project to convince a doctor mm -hmm. To implant this was very difficult. So when I found one, and when the time was coming, then I was uh, happy. I guess I was uh, nervous. I don't know if nervous. I was um, emotional. Excited. Excited. Yes, I was excited. Uh huh. Because you had to go to, was it Mexico you went to to get it done? No, 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 no. Oh. No, it was done in Barcelona. Oh, I thought it was, I thought you had to go Why? to get it. No, I might, I might, I might be confusing because, um, do you know the black alien? Mm -hmm. So I know that he gets most of his, or got most of his stuff done in Mexico because he couldn't find anyone to do, but those are more extreme things, I think. Um, those modifications. So maybe I'm confusing it with that, but I thought I heard you before say it was, you had to go abroad to get it or something. Um, no, but that's, yeah, that's very, very cool. Um, Manel went to Japan for his implants. Moon did it in New York. The tooth was done in, in Brazil and this antenna was done in, in Barcelona. Because I thought that like there's a lot, there's, did you have to get it done sort of underground? Or can it be because I thought that there are like laws against what surgeons and doctors can do to people, even if they request it. Yeah, it was it was not accepted by the bioethical committee. Yeah. So this doctor did it anonymously. Oh, thank you, Mister Anonymous Doctor. <laughs> um, and the other thing as well was I heard about your your claim to the Swedish government to become a citizen of Sweden. Um, can you explain that, please? Well, the materials that I use to create the implant are Swedish. 
So I'm telling them that I am Swedish because part of my body is Swedish. So the thing is, well, now to become Swedish, you need to live in Sweden for at least five years. Uh, and okay. I'm telling them that Sweden has lived in my body for more than five years. So I'm asking them why should I not be allowed to become a Swedish citizen? It's just um, a situation I wanted them to answer why not or why, uh, but they, it hasn't. I haven't received the reply yet. So was that quite recent? You did that? No, I did it years ago. Um, and they're still and deciding. I... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because that was... that was one of the things that I've. Um, that I found really interesting as well, that it's like, I, I I respected that about you, that you were wanting to push the boundaries to test where they are, you know, to test, to test governments and to test the limits and to put these questions, which are sort of philosophical questions, really, um, to put those out there, because obviously it's not, well, I, I imagined it wasn't, important to you necessarily whether you have a Swedish citizenship or not like if you've got the Spanish nationality and the British nationality then you don't need the Swedish one but I, th I, I thought that that was interesting just to challenge that basically for the sake of challenging it but Swedish people haven't have, responded I don't have the Spanish citizen oh you, you don't. don't no no because um, oh Spain doesn't let you have two exactly so um uh, so yes, it would be actually useful now that there's been yeah. Brexit. Have a <laughs> when I, I said this before Brexit, I the Swedish thing was just yes to, to as as a curiosity to see what what polit how would politicians answer to this uh, question, just out of curiosity. Um, but yeah, there is a, a part of me that feels very thankful to Sweden because I, thanks to Sweden, I, I have this new sense because the materials are very important in, in this um, antenna because it's, without this type of technology, I wouldn't been able to sense color. So there's a part of me that, that feels Swedish. Uh, it's, it's a true feeling. But I wanted to, yeah, to push it to the extreme of asking for um, nationality. I wonder if maybe one day IKEA will sell antennas. <laughs> maybe. Maybe they could. IKEA is a is a non profit organization. Um, I think so. I think I remember reading that the that the owner of IKEA basically turned it into a foundation. Um, and that's like one of his ethos is from from early on was to create create basically the best things they could at the lowest cost, and then he turned it to a foundation so that the the money would be kept inside and could be used for good. So maybe they would actually be good people to contact about it because they sound like um, sound like good people. Um, so what you obviously seem very busy. What do you do in your spare time? Um, well, now I'm focusing on the sense of time, which is almost done. And then I'm doing, I'm creating a new space as well for cre creating like a, a lab in Mataró. We've been in, in, in different places. Uh, we've had the space to create new senses and new organs. Mm. It was in Barcelona for, for many years and now and creating this new space here in, in Mataró. So I'm focusing on the creation of this space and uh, finishing things of the organ, the sense of time, and then look, talking to neurologists so that they can do the test now in February, the test of time before I have it included. And then there's also some trips of, abroad for some universities and in different events now in February and March. And so is this this is your full-time job, um, creating this stuff and 
do it giving talks and things like that is that how you earn your money mm-hmm. yeah oh, cool and how many people are on your team working in the lab depends on the project sometimes we've had uh 10 people working for a few months in one specific project and then sometimes it's just three people wow that's so cool and so so you have connections with the universities here and then you're you like tap into them and try and find different talent how does your recruitment process go yes it's usually students with a passion and people that contact many people just contact and sometimes they're not here they're in other countries but we connect by video call and then we collaborate in distance and what are your thoughts about Neuralink in general and have you spoken with Neuralink or have they contacted you no oh, that would be cool <laughs> no I don't like Neuralink no no why not I'm not interested in um, outputs I'm interested in inputs so uh, there are two types of ways of merging to, with technology one is uh, in order to sense more, another is to from the brain to the machine. So it's two different branches that they don't touch each other. Right. Uh, and and why why do you feel strongly about the outputs? No, I'm, I don't like what Elon Musk has been doing with animals. I'm a extreme uh, uh, animalista. Okay. So uh, this really. If he was testing it to himself, I would be really interested. But if, if he's testing the technology with others, I'm, there's something I don't like about this. Okay, so you feel like it should be the responsibility of individuals to be trying this thing, trying this upon themselves, as opposed to... But that it would be very difficult to develop something to that level if you were only testing it on one person, though. No, uh, you you don't need to do it on one person, but he's he's been doing it with animals. So would you be in favor of it if they were using human testing? Mm-hmm. Okay, so if uh, so, you're in favor of human testing as long as humans, obviously humans that want to yeah, test yeah, yeah. it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, and I'm surprised that he's not testing it on himself. I think he said that he's going to like as soon as it's ready to implant, he'd happily do it to himself. Um, because I think he wants to be one of the first people to have it. But I well, he just did it to someone else, right? Yeah, but I think the idea is that they they're starting off. I haven't looked into it recently, but the idea initially was they were first going to use it to cure people who were paralyzed, or I think as well people who were blind to help people who were blind be able to see again. So they were going to be like the initial use cases of it to cure uh, certain illnesses or help people have a better quality of life but then obviously in the long run the possibilities are endless for what they can do with it Um, you know people who are people who are totally disabled would be able to use their brain to control artificial limbs and artificial and wheelchairs and do all sorts of things I think they also wanted to use it in space for astronauts who have um who are under different gravity for them to be able to control robotic limbs and artificial limbs instead of having to use their own arms um which are effect on and legs which are affected by gravity they wanted to be able to basically accurately control things using their brain so i think that was also one of the use cases if you look at history this is all this has already been done uh, or said before, like uh, Miguel Nicolelis in Brazil. It's just that there is something strange with Elon Musk. There's always lots of news. No one really understands what he's talking about. And then when you seriously look into it, there are things, many of the things he said, they've already been tested years ago by like Miguel Nicolelis, for example, is one of the main people that have tested this, what you just said. And then 
what uh, no one really knows what he's doing because uh, he's just saying that he's doing it and that he will do it but in reality I don't know what to say about it about his neural link because there's not there's nothing to talk about yet so it's really all very speculation right now I think they have a few days ago I think they did implant it into the first human exactly so where is this human I mean who is he nobody knows all the scientists are saying well we don't know there's no scientific report from what he's done so it's really I don't know when people ask me about Elon Musk I don't know what to say because there's nothing to say yet you can talk about other things from the past, like Miguel Nicolelis, you can talk about this because there's many reports from it. Uh, Kevin Warwick, what he did, there is many reports as well. So what did the two but, of those people do? What what did they discover? Well, uh, Miguel Nicolelis, he, he, he discovered that it was faster. He had the monkey connected to a, a, a robot and when the monkey was walking, he was making the the robot walk faster than his own leg, because oh. the from the brain to the robot it was faster than from the brain to his own leg. So he he realized that you can move uh, robots with your mind faster than you can move your own body, for example. Or Kevin Warwick, he was able to connect in nineteen like twenty years ago. Uh, chip to his nervous system and send send signs to someone else using his own body. So these are tests that we can talk about, but I don't know what to say about Neuralink. I can only say what he's done to the animals mm. uh, for now. So it's really difficult to give an opinion because nobody knows if he's saying things in order to have more money in his own... Like There's a lot of is is not the very transparent uh, person, so I, I'm not sure what to say with about him yet. Maybe next year mm. or in two years, I, I will have a something to say. Yeah, I, well, I hope it goes well, and I hope that he manages to create things that can stop people from being blind or stop people from being deaf, and hopefully, people can start walking again if they use the loss of their limbs. Um, so hopefully some positive things will come out of it. Um, but what I usually do, I think, uh, we should wrap it up soon. Um, what I usually do at the end of my set of the podcast is I ask my guests for their words of wisdom. So if you had some words of wisdom for the listeners, what would they be? Words of wisdom? Yes. Um, like, I don't know. Like, okay, I can rephrase that. Advice to your younger self. Um, um, I don't know. (laughs) Um... Gosh, I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) Words of wisdom are, it's okay if you don't have all the answers. (laughs) (laughs) It's okay to not have an answer. Yeah, that's my, (laughs) yeah, that, that would be. And where can people find you? and find out more information about what you're doing and where can they follow your project? Um, I don't know either because I'm, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not, maybe Instagram, that's the only, okay. some, but I haven't posted anything since last year or so. So I'm, I, I give talks and, in sometimes but i don't know i don't announce them either so it's mm. i don't uh, i don't have a <laughs> i don't have a a place where i tell people what i'm doing 
right now. No. And what about uh, websites for the cyborg? The what was it called? The cyborg organization. Um, the two organizations you mentioned earlier. Yeah, there is one. I think Cyborg Foundation. There is one, but it's uh, static. And then Cyborg Arts as well, but it's also I don't manage them. Okay. So I don't know. They they exist. And but they they don't announce things either. So and they don't maybe they are. Um, I don't know. I really don't know. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, not a problem. And usually at the end as well, um, I usually give my guests uh, one of these T-shirts. So it's got this and it's got that on the back. But I will post that over to you um, and you can have one of our Quest for Wisdom T-shirts. Uh, thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Um, but it's been really amazing. I'm really excited just to keep up with what you're doing. Um, so please do post some more things that we can follow and that we can see. Um, and yeah, I'd love to catch up later on in the year or to next year or something to hear about the time project. Um, because I think okay. that that is especially exciting. Um, and if you do hold any events in Mataro, then let me know. I'd love to come along um, okay. and to see what's going on there. So yeah, but it's, it's been really amazing, Neil. Keep up the good work. Um and yeah, I wish you I wish you luck with your time project. Thank you. Um and I hope it all goes well. Thanks so much. To you. Thank you. Thanks for listening, everybody. Goodbye. Thank you for listening to the Quest for Wisdom podcast with your host, Connor Monaghan. If you enjoyed the episode and would like to support the show, then please like it, subscribe, and leave a review on whichever platform you are using. This small act is a massive help and is hugely appreciated. You can find more information about all of our guests on thequestforwisdom.com and follow us at The Quest for Wisdom on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter for exciting updates. We also have a Patreon account for anyone who would like to contribute towards the running of the show. Finally, I would like to thank the Comedy Clubhouse in Barcelona for allowing us to record here and for their ongoing support. If you are ever in Barcelona, make sure to check it out for daily shows of comedy and performance art in English. Farewell for now.